it's very nice to have the chance to spend these couple of hours together with you and talk about plant variety protection. My name is Michele Dubini and I am part of the European IP Help Desk training team. And uh, excuse me for this uh, background noise. Um, today, we're going uh, to follow and talk about uh, plant variety protection. Uh, but before we start uh, doing that and we start uh, with the actual content of the, the webinar, um, I'd like to steal you a couple of minutes and talk about a couple of administrative thematics that we usually cover before the webinar is started. Um, before that as well, uh, I think it's due uh, to politeness to say a big hello and thank you to our speaker, uh, Orsola Lamberti, from the um, European uh, Office for Plant Variety Protection in Anger, France. Thank you very much for being here with us today, Ursula. It's always a pleasure to host you. you. And uh, I can hear you and see you very well, which is great. Uh, by now, you can all able you are all able to see us, but uh, we're going uh, after this short uh, uh, introductory presentation. We're going to. Uh, switch off our videos uh, because of uh, potential internet restriction that there might be and uh, we might have uh, then difficulties so in order to prevent uh, those uh, difficulties we are going simply to switch off our video and uh, just to go on with the presentation. Um, now before I get boring. I, I'm going to tell you a couple of information on the European IP Help Desk, which is the initiative of the European Commission for uh, which uh, I am working now for a couple of years, and uh, that is going to give us the chance uh, today to uh, cover this thematic and talk about plant variety protection. So <clears throat> we are um, we have the objective of uh, addressing and uh, try to help. Uh, potential beneficiaries of uh, EU-funded projects uh, and researchers and small and medium enterprises in the European Union to understand and get on well with uh, intellectual property and intellectual property rights topics uh, so that, for example, they're more prepared for uh, proposals or uh, EU-funded projects, but also in the day-to-day -day activities that might have to deal with IP and IPR. Uh, we are a first free of charge, uh, first line advice on uh, intellectual property content, meaning that uh, any question that you might have regarding IP and IP rights uh, might find a answer uh, in one of the small clouds you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, because um, through our website, uh, you can see on the uh, left down side uh, of your screen, www.iprhelpdesk.eu, uh, you have access to a variety of services like trainings, for example, today, which are online uh, and in the next few months uh, as well. As you may imagine, it has been hard in 2020 to carry out on-site training and it will be hard in 2021 apparently as well. So by now, um, you know, the best we can offer is on online uh, trainings and we're trying to do that at the best of our possibilities. Um, today we will be talking about plant varieties protection, but in the next few weeks uh, uh, we have prepared webinars regarding artificial intelligence, technology transfer, uh, we have prepared webinars regarding freedom to operate, and so on and so forth. I'm going to uh, show them to you in the next few slides. We also have a large amount of publications available online, um, like um, guides and fact sheets on um, intellectual property, uh, and um, in Horizon 2020, in commercialization activities, contracts, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, we have um, templates that you can use, like non disclosure agreements or uh, like uh, license agreements, and so on and so forth. We have an ambassador scheme that might be very near to you, to your uh, um, country or city where you're based. And most importantly, probably, we have a helpline sitting in Alicante with experts that are waiting for your questions and uh, are happy to answer to all of them. Now, uh, I've, I've been talking about the website, the training, the publications online, but uh, we also have activities going on 
on YouTube with audiovisual content that is available for you where our speakers uh, actually explain uh, their topic, the topic they tackle in the webinars or in the on-site trainings. And um, also um, anime uh, that uh, explain intellectual property content, uh, which are sympathetic and uh, right to the point. Uh, we also active on social medias like um, LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So if you'd like to discuss on intellectual property topics on those two platforms, we're happy uh, to join you in the conversation and discuss with you with the most interesting topic of intellectual property rights. I have been telling you that uh, the helpline is active and the helpline is waiting for your questions. So a couple of infos regarding our experts there as well. Uh, they are a free of charge first line IP support, meaning that that's not a legal service um, or legal advice, uh, but it's just a suggestion about how to proceed with uh, the intellectual property that you might have or to answer your questions regarding IP and IPR. It is, however, personal, meaning that they're going uh, to answer uh, to your uh, specific questions, and it's personal as well because it's confidential, meaning that none of the information that you're going to share with them is going to be given to third parties, and that might be pretty important when it comes to novelty and patent registration, design registration, and so on and so forth. The answer is pretty quick. It's going to be within three working days, and you can ask your questions through email, phone, uh, or through the website. Question can be in different languages, but we suggest them to be in English. It's going to be much easier to find one of the experts that is going to be able to talk that language. A couple of um, further information about the webinars. Um, the ones you can see coming up in March are uh, there for you um, to register. if you'd like to, meaning IP commercialization and licensing and effective IP and outreach strategies to innovation. The other ones that uh, have already been carried out, I have decided to provide you a recording mm, so that uh, even through the slides, you can have access to our online uh, library for recordings and uh, you can check out what has already happened. And if you'd like to, you're very welcome to register to those webinars in uh, the second half of the year because they're going to be repeated. We're very happy if you can join us. I told you there's a ambassador scheme active in Europe. Um, might be that some ambassadors have joined us today for this webinar and therefore um, special thanks uh, for the work they are doing. And uh, again, I take the opportunity um, to tell them um, that we're very glad and happy that we have a chance to work with such professional all around Europe. Uh, it's a pleasure for the European IP help desk and um, uh, thank you therefore once again. There are other siblings so to say of our services uh, if you're interested in one of uh, the services that I've just explained uh, which have as core uh, the European Union uh, for their uh, uh, for uh, their activities uh, but instead you'd like uh, to move out of the EU and you're interested in information uh, about uh, intellectual property in China, Southeast Asia or Latin America or as well in 2021 we have opened up a new um, IP SME help desk in uh, uh, the subcontinent of India and I saw that uh, today we have um, uh, representative Nepal from the PVP Indian office, which is something uh, that never happened before. So a very big welcome to you, um, Deepal. Uh, we're very happy uh, that uh, the outreach is so uh, extended that it has uh, reached you in India as well. But just for your information, we've just opened up a dedicated uh, IPS knee help desk in um, uh, this India subcontinent, and therefore. Uh, we hope that our activities together can multiply themselves. One last information regarding the IP booster, which is as well an initiative of the European Commission that is there to um, develop the results that are coming from R and um, I 
activities, from universities, from projects, uh, in order to exploit uh, the results that are created through uh, research uh, and uh, innovation activities uh, and being able to use them uh, within the market as efficiently as possible. Check out the website of the IP Booster and see whether you might be uh, eligible for the services that are going uh, to be provided or that have already started actually from last year. Having said that, I think I have come to the end of my short introduction. I tried to keep it as uh, short as possible. Now I'm going to give the word to my colleague uh, Ursula that is going to start with the actual content of uh, uh, today's webinar. So um, thank you very much once again, uh, Ursula, for being with us. And I'll take back the word in a few slides. Okay, thank you, Miguel. I can I share my my screen? Yeah. Okay. Let's show share my present. I'll start with my presentation. I hope that you see it quite well. So uh, thank you, Miguel. Before I start this presentation, I really uh, wanted to thank you for this opportunity to give us a platform and uh, a public to explain a little bit uh, what uh, plant variety protection is about and what we do and how this is important for us and we hope for consumers and the society in general. It's very ambitious. Um, I also wanted to express to you how uh, every time the I see your introduction, I see that you are carrying out more activities that uh, uh, work that the help desk does for SMEs in the European Union, but also outside of the European Union is, uh, is great. I think that your uh, service, your hotline, it's really developing in a great manner. And uh, I really thank you for that because Plum Variety Rights uh, protection is also about uh, SMEs, SMEs, uh, small medium enterprises. Um, very often, new plant varieties come to the market or thanks to uh, these family uh, managed enterprises. So thank you for that. And I think that I can start with my presentation. A very short outline of what uh, we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, today's presentation is a little bit different. Usually we focus on the technical part of plant variety protection, but this time I really wanted to spend some time on uh, um, explaining why, uh, what do we do exactly and what is the, um, our objective and purpose in the medium and long period. So the first part of this presentation uh, is going to be about the subject matter and what new plants and new plant varieties can do uh, for society or what they can do for businesses in a, in a more general way. And then in the second part of the presentation, we will try to explain what do we do in the European Union, how we run the system of protection and why we think it's important to protect new plant varieties. So without further ado, uh, we will start simple, subject matter. Uh, why do we care about plant variety protection? Because we want more new plant varieties on the market and uh, um, at disposal of consumers and of the industry. So uh, the purpose of this uh, IP right, as the purpose of uh, patents and design, is to foster innovation. But foster innovation in a very specific uh, field, which is the field of, of uh, plant breeding. Uh, plant breeding basically consists, we will see that in a minute, in the creation of new plants. This is an a technical definition, a definition that I call for lawyers. So it's very simple. Uh, all those techniques, genetics in the field, in the laboratory, that allow us to have uh, new plants, plants that are different from what we saw in the common knowledge before. And this is, of course, for the benefit, for the benefit of society. And we will see how in a uh, few slides. Why do we care so much about the creation of new plants? Do we really need uh, new plants? Don't we have enough biodiversity in the world? Well, actually, uh, what plant breeding can do in the creation of new plants, it's, uh, it's uh, um, has plenty of options. And uh, I have to say uh, that this, pre this presentation today is quite ambitious because I will try to explain to you what this kind of innovation can do for society, but there is so much more. We can say it's an entire universe, it's really interesting, and if you want to know more, just 
let me know at the end of this presentation i will leave you my 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 contact uh, here i put some examples of what a new plant can do what is this possible uh, we can start from the productive agricultural land um, what does it mean it means that uh, in, with the move from the countryside to big um, big agglomerates and big cities um, it is necessary uh, nowadays to be able to use uh, and cultivate certain plant variety especially food crops uh, to feed the population in a, in a smaller space um, it is possible through uh, plant variety innovation to create new plants that have uh, an improved yield so they can produce more in a smaller place actually um, in the in the um, in the field of plant breeding the um, general thought of uh, producing more with less so with less land less water use uh, less en uh, energy input is uh, um, is a great trend in the innovation um, there is a lot of research going on on that there is a lot of investment uh, done on that why because uh, we we have an increasing population we all know that and this population has to be fed um, sometimes in, in uh, very difficult climatic conditions sometimes in places where uh, water is uh, uh, is not sufficient when uh, uh, there are droughts so of course plant variety innovation can help us with that can can allow us to feed these uh, portions of the population that otherwise would not uh, have the same access uh, to, to these food crops. So this goes also, um, this general uh, speech, of course, refers to, um, I hope you can see my arrows, to these more nutritious crops, uh, water use. And on this side, you have the climate change and the, let's say, the sustainability aspect of agriculture. Because um, it's important to feed uh, the, an increasing population, but this um, has to be done in a, in a sustainable way. Um, in a sustainable way and through also uh, resilient crops. Climate change is uh, creating, is uh, changing, uh, changing, of course, the needs of agriculture in uh, several regions of the world. And uh, obviously, uh, plant breeding can create resilient crops. We, we talked about uh, drought, be, but uh, this can be virtually applied to any other uh, to any other mutation of the environment that is caused by climate change. And then we also have the um, here I put you the use of chemicals and new diseases. It is possible to create um, uh, new plant varieties that are naturally um, not subject to certain disease certain pests. Pests and disease change all the time. You, you saw that with COVID. They can mutate all the time. This is not, that's just nature. And uh, uh, some, uh, some pests, some viruses, some bacteria can affect the entire crops. And uh, uh, once again, put in danger the food security of an entire region. And uh, of course, creating uh, um, a crop, a food crop, let's say corn, that is uh, uh, naturally resistant to a certain disease um, would allow to feed this part of the population and without the use of any chemicals. So it becomes also more uh, sustainable from an environmental point of view. So this is what we can do with plant innovation when it comes to our environment. However, um, plant innovation is also a business. So it can also be profitable and this is uh, the case especially for ornamental varieties because um, innovation is not only about fruit food crops it is not only about uh, fodder and feeding the population but it's also about uh, ornamental crops we're talking about uh, flowers shrubs and uh, all those uh, plants that are not edible the, but they uh, very nicely decorate uh, our homes and uh, why is this important? Well, this is actually a very, um, a very relevant uh, business opportunity for many growers. And once again, um, small and medium enterprises with uh, uh, that usually are managed by uh, by families uh, since uh, since many years, etc. Here, I really wanted to put you um, these uh, numbers. Uh, I we got this uh, these statistics from uh, Eurostat. You can uh, when you will receive the presentation, uh, all this uh, link here 
or bring you to the to the source. And uh, just to give you an idea, the EU and UK production of flowers and plants in 2019 had produced a turnover up to 22 thousand millions of euros. This is an, an, an incredible number and it really makes you understand how even the ornamental sector that sometimes is less, uh, um, uh, doesn't really uh, attract our attention while it actually creates an excellent business opportunity. In the European Union and, uh, uh, and in other countries outside of the European Union. This is the case, for instance, of uh, rose production in Kenya. Rose production has been uh, thriving in Kenya uh, because this country has, the, has been uh, investing in innovation and in the growth of uh, of roses that are appreciated and actually exported all over the world. Well, this created a business opportunity, not only for local businesses, but also uh, gave a job to uh, specific sections of the population, including women uh, who were Thanks to this, uh, to this new business, they were um, able to support their families and to have uh, uh, working in the, um, in, the, in the greenhouses for roses. So this is just an example of what um, economically um, plant breeding can do. So how do we do it? Uh, we saw what we can do with new plants, what new plants can do for us, for our business, for our uh, food production, but how do we do it? Uh, sometimes when we think about creating a plant, uh, we just think that it appears, it takes maybe, uh, it's, it's some kind of magical. Before working in this field, I just never wondered uh, how do you create a plant? But it's actually uh, a very uh, a very long process, and uh, and uh, it's very diverse techniques can be used in this field. We can go from domestication to scientific breeding. I put you here this slide that goes from 10,000 years ago to the 19th century when scientific breeding started. But you see, these two circles are interconnected because uh, scientific breeding is not, uh, and it, it can also consist of, um, for instance, genetic engineer, but it's not simply magic, it comes from uh, domestication. What's domestication? It's simply uh, taking advantage of the natural mutation that happens in every organism, uh, including plants. It's identifying a mutation with desired characteristic and uh, reproducing it over and over again until our crop ha has a certain characteristic. This takes a very, a very, very long time, usually stabilizing an already found mutation because first you have to find the mutation and then you have to stabilize it. Stabilizing it requires between 10 and 15 years with normal techniques. And with scientific breeding, it can take far less. However, scientific breeding is very, requires an investment in research and development behind, uh, behind the, the, the breeder. And uh, of course, uh, uh, an infrastructure in the university, in the research center, or in the company that allows the scientific breeding. So you can see that creating new plants is not magic, uh, it, it seems like magic to us, but it requires a very high uh, investment of resources and or time. So I think I can give the floor to Michele yeah. for this I'm slide. Back, uh, for this slide here, because I have a quick question for the audience. You should be able to see now uh, our question there. So you could see before uh, the three uh, the three images that we gave you of uh, wild uh, uh, plants. Can you identify three the three of them? So two of the options that you have here are wrong, but uh, three of them are right. So I would give you a couple of minutes, perhaps, to try and answer and see whether you can find uh, the right uh, varieties. It's interesting because I was completely wrong as I tried to do it uh, before the webinar. And let's see whether you're better than me in uh, the knowledge. I have to say it's not really easy to understand 
uh, what they are and um, I put a couple of um, tricks to try to fool you and uh, but some of you are too good apparently for the tricks I did um, going on uh, uh, still for uh, for one minute in order to give uh, to our uh, in, in order to give to our speaker the chance to rest for a couple of seconds uh, I cannot show you the at the moment the pictures uh, once again uh, but I will show them to you in 20 seconds because then I'll close up the meeting. So there we go, two minutes, can close it. And um, so let's see that you, 40% of you has answered Apple which is um, understandable because I thought that uh, the ones you can see in the middle were Apple or yeah um, or something similar in fact they are aubergines so congratulations to the 20 for the to the 52 percent of you who's um, answered aubergine then on the left hand side for me that was definitely a some kind of tropical fruit that's why I made the trick of uh, putting the papaya in the uh, possible answers, but unfortunately, papaya was wrong. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a banana with a lot of imagination from our days, but it is. And finally, on the right hand side, we have a corn, uh, which I thought also was uh, um, chickpeas at the beginning. Now, my show is over, so I can give you back the word. Uh, uh, Ursula, thank you very much. Um, can I share my screen? I'm not sure that you, you can see my screen right now. It's already shared. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. So, um, uh, this was, um, thank you, Michele. This was a really quick poll, and uh, it was a way to uh, making you understand what, uh, um, how uh, we can really um, change nature when it comes to, uh, when it comes to bringing the techniques. And I really hope that you enjoyed it. I found these are the most surprising wild versions of modern varieties that I that I found. But actually, there's plenty of examples. You just don't try to Google it, or you just go into an infinite loop and find yourself at three in the morning uh, googling eggplants. Anyways, so breeding techniques. Um, I'll be very very brief on that because the ways we can create new plant varieties are uh, I wouldn't say infinite but very close to that and actually breeding techniques are a separate universe because um, plant variety rights are a very small niche of IP uh, of intellectual property however behind this very small niche there is um, a quantity of studies and uh, a number of people working on completely different fields um, for the same result. So um, I'd like to start from this very, uh, the, this is the basis of breeding techniques. It's what we mentioned before, uh, simply selecting what I want and multiplying it until all the off offsprings of a certain variety show the characteristics that I want. They're juicier, they produce um, juicier, they produce more, they have a certain color. Crossing also can also can give uh, us certain characteristic. What it's uh, um, what I found particularly interesting in the beginning of my work was this mutagenesis, uh, which basically consists in exposing a certain variety, a certain plant, to a certain um, a certain uh, race. So when we um, uh, when we put this plant under this race, basically this enhances the possibility of further mutation. Uh, but mutation is random. So um, what we can do is just uh, exposing the plant to this race and then hoping for our desired mutation to come up. It takes a little bit less 
than the, uh, the mutagenesis that happens in nature, but it's still quite laborious, it's, uh, it really takes time. It made me think of the X-Men or something, but uh, it's something that happens. And then we have DNA editing, which uh, uh, is really surprising and sometimes really consists in uh, cutting a couple of genes from uh, a species and putting it into another plant species. This is different from a transgenic uh, uh, organisms where um, the section of DNA come from bacteria and a completely different organism. Usually the, the more modern breeding techniques, uh, the uh, CRISPR, we call it, uh, consist in this uh, cut and paste of genes from plant to plant. So it doesn't really uh, create the same, uh, the same uh, problems that we saw in transgenic organism. But once again, this is another universe that today we do not have the time to tackle. So um, now that we know the breeding techniques, uh, it's also important to know who are the breeders, who are these people that work the magic and give, and give us new varieties or uh, a flower in a, in a different colors. We go from gardeners to farmers, so very small entities, uh, individuals to um, multinational companies and to universities and research entities. And here we can see how breeding uh, does not always have a, um, necessary um, a profit purpose behind. So of course we have our multinational companies in here who produce very high quantity of corn to feed the population in the European Union and then outside. However, we also have enthusiasts of plant breeding who like to cross their flowers or their food crop um, and they also uh, um, get the same protection we will see they get the same rights as multinational companies as universities global policies so uh, once uh, that we know uh, what we do how we do it how do we create these, uh, these plans, I'd really like to uh, go back to the environmental relevance of uh, plant innovation and uh, from the point of view of global policies and EU policy. Um, obviously, when we talk about global policy, we have to mention the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are a universal call to end poverty and um, enhance sustainability and in general to uh, modify our society so that our life on this planet is more, is more sustainable and it can continue. Uh, they were called by the United Nations and they were put in the 2030 agenda. Uh, what is this agenda? It's um, very simply uh, a, cert, a set of goals that all uh, the countries in the United Nations uh, agreed upon um, so that we can achieve sustainable development in 15 years, in a 15 years plan, which is very, very ambitious, but uh, it's, uh, it's a start. So uh, here you have a link to the dedicated page of the SDG. Uh, it's very interesting, it's very explicative. If you want to have a look, I really advise you to, to check it out. And uh, my next slide is on how plant variety protection contributes to all of these uh, uh, sustainable goals. Um, I have two slides on this and it's uh, we have uh, um, goals 1 to 9 and 12, 15, 17. I'm not going to go through that one by one, um, but I'm going to um, kind of group them. Uh, I'll, group them the, I'll, group, I'll group the first two which is related to uh, food production and innovation in food crops. Um, these goals uh, also entail the end of poverty and the end of hunger. End of hunger, once again, as we saw before, doesn't mean only feeding the population, but it means uh, feeding the population uh, so that uh, crops are nutritious and affordable. Affordable means that they, they, prefer, they should be produced uh, on a local basis. So, uh, clearly, 
uh, plant variety protection and creating uh, uh, resilient crops that can be cultivated in several regions of the world allows and uh, facilitates this uh, reaching this objective. Um, and number nine, we can see um, the building of a, resi a resilient infrastructure and promote uh, an inclusive and sustainable industrialization. Um, why uh, do we mention this um, uh, this SDG? It's because uh, plum variety protection and plum variety innovation can allow the um, the use of new business models in the in the agricultural sector. So not only uh, GMOs, not only transgenic products, but also naturally res resilient crops can be uh, an occasion for business. And uh, um, Indeed, the food production, even if it's done on an industry basis, so it's not only local, it's not done only by farmers, um, should, be, um, should be made in a responsible way, should be uh, also consider the protection of life on land and should also, of course, be, again, once again, sustainable. And then we have, we finish with um, Goal 17, which is uh, uh, actually very relevant in uh, many, many fields. So not only the one of ag agriculture and it's uh, the uh, enhancement of networking and the connection among uh, um, among uh, national authorities. Why is this important? Because um, a plum ready protection uh, is about intellectual property, which is a, a territorial right. And uh, um, meaning that it is essential that countries agree on certain basic principles so that intellectual property rights can be uh, registered and enforced not only in one territory but hopefully globally. It's also important that uh, um, mm, there is not only uh, intellectual property protection but also that we allow um, research entities and uh, universities to uh, carry out their research and development uh, projects and cooperation and exchange of knowledge, exchange of view is essential in this. So uh, this is just uh, um, um, some examples of how plant variety rights, uh, plant variety innovation can contribute to the SDGs. What it's really important for me that we remember is that is this objective is uh, feeding the world and providing sufficient, safe, and affordable and nutritious food. This is uh, all these characteristics are necessary, and uh, um, they all imply a change in the business model that now uh, are applied in agriculture towards a more sustainable uh, approach. And that can be um, that can be reliable and also uh, feasible in the not only in 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 this future but also in the medium and long term. I take this. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of this uh, moment just to remind you that 2021 is the International Year of Fruit and Vegetables, uh, which is uh, an initiative promoted by the FAO, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, when you will receive the slide, you will be able to see uh, this little video that I will not show to you right now, so that we can dig in and the rest of the presentation. But please, uh, if you have the opportunity, just uh, have a look. These are, let's say, the important, uh, um, the essential characteristics of this uh, initiative. We do, not, uh, um, uh, we do not act directly on the reduction of food loss, of course, because this is more a responsibility of consumers and the other kinds, other sectors of the industry. However, we are uh, we are very important in here in the innovation sector, as you may imagine. So uh, these are the global policies. Um, the global policies also inspired, obviously, the European Union policy. I'll be very brief on that. I just want to mention to you the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. The Green Deal is, uh, um, is a strategy that was uh, signed by the, uh, the new European Commission and uh, as, as objective, the, the, the European Union to become climate neutral by 2050. This is a, a quite uh, um, ambitious but uh, definitely feasible objective and innovation in the in agriculture 
in the way that we explained before can be a precious tool for uh, reaching that objective. And then I'd like to mention the, far the farm to fork strategy that uh, refers in particular not only to be carbon neutral, but to the food chain. And um, this strategy really refers to a food chain that works for many stakeholders, uh, consumers, producers, and uh, the environment. Uh, consumers so that they can have affordable food and nutritious food, producers so, that, so they can have um, um, a feasible, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> So they can uh, have uh, profitable uh, business opportunities and of course uh, uh, that these opportunities are sustainable. These are some of the examples. I don't have to repeat myself anymore but one but once again improved resistance to pests uh, for instance means that we do not need to use chemicals, which means uh, working towards the adaptation to climate change and sustainability in a, in a better way in the framework of those strategies. So, uh, we, until now we say how innovation is important, what innovation can do, who are the innovators, but uh, how do we protect it? So this is the moment where we uh, talk about um, intellectual property rights and uh, why do we think that uh, community plant variety rights in the European Union are the way to go to sustain all this uh, objective. It's, uh, it, this is a very basic concept of intellectual property, is the, con is the theory of the social contract or the incentives theory, um, a, a lot bore you with the details of this uh, of this theory but basically the idea is that uh, with intellectual property rights we provide to the innovator a temporary monopoly so that they can uh, they are encouraged to invest in innovation um, the monopoly is uh, um, very is um, is not infinite, so he has to end in our case after 25 or 30 years depending on the crop so that society can uh, enjoy that innovation, can take advantage of that innovation without any, uh, any limitation. Actually we will see in a few slides that even uh, in community plant variety rights, even when there is uh, this monopoly, there are some limitations that are meant to foster innovation even during those 25 and 30 years. And uh, obviously, the final, the final goal, and this is essential, we saw that in the first slide, is the benefit of society. Uh, because we do want to foster innovation, we, we do want innovators to get back their investment because investing in a new plant variety can be very, very expensive. We're talking about one million, one million and a half of euros, and this is the example of a successful project for one plant variety. However, we also want our population to have affordable food and we want to uh, we want innovators to be encouraged in the future and to have access to this technology that shouldn't be kept as a secret. Okay, so to start talking about community plant variety, right, um, we have to understand what's a variety. Our uh, I won't say our because you may think there is the definition of the CPVO, so I'll say my definition of plant variety is uh, uh, the most specific description of organism in the kingdom of plants. I could have used Article 5 of our basic regulation, but it's a text like this, it's a paragraph, and for lawyers, even it's, it's really technical. So you can go with this definition, it's just the most specific description we can give to a plant. Uh, what does it mean more specific? Well, actually, all plants or living organisms are uh, classified uh, through a science that is called taxonomy. And uh, they, we have bigger groups. In our case, the biggest group is the kingdom of uh, plants. Uh, as humans, we are, uh, we are part of the kingdom of animals, for instance, uh, but we are interested in the, in the plant kingdom. And uh, these big groups are are then divided in smaller and smaller groups and in this case we have the uh, the example of apples uh, where we have the big kingdom of plants in which we can identify the angiosperms 
uh, clade, which means simply it's a very long word, very scary word to say that these plants are able to produce flowers. And then we go more in this, into the specific until here, the last two, this is the genus and this is the species. So to understand of what species we're talking about, we use the Malus domestica, so the genus and the, uh, the species name. This is not the variety. The variety is actually in between, in, uh, within the species. So as you know, apples come in all, uh, in all colors and uh, um, this very green and crunchy and delicious apple is the Brandy Smith. So this is a variety. This is the most specific way we can describe a certain apple. So this is what we protect, this is what we examine when it comes to the, um, to the community plant variety rights. Um, I will be very, very, very brief in the, um, on the legal framework. What's the basis of our entire system is the UPAV Convention, is the international convention uh, that uh, created the system first in uh, um, in uh, 78 and then in 1991. On the basis of the signature and ratification of that international treaty, uh, the European Union issued uh, a regulation that is what we call the basic regulation, is the Bible, let's say, of plant variety protection in the European Union, and it is this uh, regulation. So our legal framework, uh, what we base our system in, is basically this. And then we also have reference to the uh, legislations of the member states because the European Union, in the European Union, uh, we have a regional system of protection. We will see that in a second, uh, but we also have the national legislations to be considered. Okay, so um, this is my uh, first, uh, uh, quite, uh, let's say, technical slide. Um, uh, plant variety protection in the EU. Uh, the EU implemented, as we saw, a sui generis system of plant variety protection. What does it mean? It means that this is not a patent, it's not a design, it's not a trademark, it's not a GI. This is another uh, intellectual property right that was created in, uh, uh, for the first time in the European Union in 1994 with the regulation that we saw before, and it's separate. It's obviously consistent with the TRIPS agreement that we know uh, quite well if we work in the intellectual property uh, protection field. Anyways, it's an international treaty on intellectual property protection uh, where many, many countries of the world are signatories. Um, we are also based on the UBOV Convention, uh, the International Convention for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants. We saw that uh, two minutes ago. And uh, uh, we mentioned how it's a regional system. Uh, a regional system means that uh, uh, one right is registered at the CPBO, and then that right has a uniform effect in all the 27 member states of the European Union, in the same way as it happens with community designs and uh, uh, European Union trademarks. Or, for instance, all the IP uh, rights in the Benelux area, which are valid for the three countries of the, of the Benelux. Um, what do we do? Uh, through uh, plant variety protection in the European Union, we uh, protect uh, all botanical genera and species. This is actually our obligation. We cannot refuse the protection of a new species that we don't know on the basis that, for instance, we do not have the infrastructure. We have the obligation to give protection to all species and that protection lasts for 25 years or 30 years for certain kinds of crops, so uh, among which we have uh, vines, trees and potato varieties. Actually, the extension to more, uh, to more crops is discussed uh, at the level of the Commission and, but uh, this, is, uh, this is what we have at this, uh, at this point. The reason is that the breeding of these uh, varieties uh, can take more time uh, and, uh, and they have a very high economic relevance. Limitation. So before we mentioned how it's important to give a monopoly to the breeder to um, uh, give them a reason to keep investing into innovation. However, we also 
have to uh, take into consideration other stakeholders in the uh, agricultural sector. And this is why uh, plumerity protection provides for um, two limitations that are not uh, um, proper of the patent system, for instance. The first is the farm safe seeds. Um, uh, basically, the farm safe seeds uh, limitation uh, allows farmers to use a certain plant variety uh, for the production in their holdings. What does it mean? It means that a farmer can uh, purchase a new plant variety and then use it in its own holding uh, for, for um, uh, any profit, for, for the holding itself, etc. However, it's also possible for farmers to harvest a part of, this, uh, of these crops and uh, to use the seeds for the years after to keep planting and reproducing these varieties so that they can feed uh, um, their, um, their, their holding. So their, their family, their, han their animals, it really depends on the crops. It could be food or it could be food crops. And then we have the breeders exemption. Um, when it comes to patents, um, if something is protected by patent, it, this is a very general uh, statement, of course. Um, when, some, so when a certain technology is covered by a patent, it is possible, obviously, to experiment on that. And uh, however, when that experiment leads to the production of a new invention, it is necessary to ask for an authorization and uh, eventually to pay royalties to the initial innovator. This is not the case for plant varieties. Even when a plant variety, a certain plant, is protected, it is possible to experiment on that, and this is the experimental exception, and it is also common to, to patent. However, if uh, from the experiments on that protected variety, I manage to obtain a new variety, I do not need to ask any authorization to the national breeder. I do not need to pay anything. This is this is to encourage innovation and it's also because in my view at, at the beginning of this uh, job it was because um plants are not created from uh, uh they're not like machines they have to be created from uh, more vegetal material so we do need to have the, pos the possibility to uh, work on that material without any limitation and this is what happens in plant protection uh, we saw before, so um, once I have my new plant, what uh, I can do is to choose between a regional protection on the European Union level or uh, several national titles. This is a choice that really depends on the breeder. It may depend on the size of its enterprise. Um, maybe I only have a national business, so I'm not really interested into protecting my variety in the 27 mem member states, or maybe I'm, I'm thinking about expanding in the future. This is a decision that has to be made in the beginning when we start the protection, because then after this is not possible anymore. What is important is that there is no possibility for double protection. Once um, Clearly, the breeder has the possibility to apply for registration on a national level and then uh, also on a European Union level. However, the national title, the national right, will not be in force. The European Union one will prevail in the, begin in the meantime. The role of the CPVO. So this is what happens uh, in the European Union when it comes to plant variety protection. We saw the legal basis. We saw that we have uh, one application for the 27 member states and a need for cooperation and coordination with the national authorities. What do we do? So uh, in the presentation, uh, Michele said that I work as legal advisor at the Community Plant Variety Office. Uh, we are a European Union agency. So we depend, uh, we are part of the uh, European Union Commission of the Sante uh, Direction General, uh, so the one on uh, health, basically. And we run the system. We are a little bit like a UIPO uh, for trademarks but, uh, and designs, but smaller. And uh, we are based in Angers, in France. I'm actually uh, recording this webinar uh, from, uh, from the office. It's very nice. Uh, come visit. And uh, this is our mission statement. 
what do we do? We run the system as it's created by the UPOV convention and the basic regulation that we saw before. And what we do is not only managing the system, but it's also trying to promote it uh, for the benefit of society. And you see this field uh, uh, from the beginning, this benefit for society. We do it for profit, for sustainability, access to food crops, etc. Uh, the strategy, why do we promote the system, why do we run the system in the way that we do, is uh, our objective is basically to uh, try to make it, uh, to, to make our system like the natural choice for the protection of IP in the plant variety field. And uh, what we do, we try to do as a European Union agency internally is to be innovative and a people-driven organization that promotes not only innovation, but in general EU values. So this is us. And this is the application procedure. We saw that before. Uh, CPVR is a very scary acronym, acronym that means Community Plant Variety Rights. It doesn't have a, a short name, this is what we have, it's a, a description. Uh, it's community because um, the, our basic regulation was issued when before the Maastricht Treaty, so um, we were not called European Union at the time. Uh, what we have in here, it's uh, uh, one application with one procedure, one technical examination, and we will see what's a technical examination, with one decision uh, that is valid, a decision on the ground, of course, uh, uh, where it's valid in uh, 27 member states of the European Union. The requirements. If you want to register your new plant, you need to be compliant uh, with at least five requirements. Uh, here on the top of the presentation we have the technical requirements which are the requirements that the plant per se, the, in, the, the plant uh, variety, has to, has to, must have to be registered and there are distinctness, uniformity and stability. We will see that in a second. And then here we have the legal requirements which are novelty and variety denomination. So let's start from the technical requirements. Distinctness, uniformity, and stability. I really hope that this slide is clear. Uh, I, I found it really, really clear. It's uh, because it's easier than it looks. Distinctness, uh, it's uh, in many cases quite similar to the concept of novelty in patents. It means that my new plant has to have at least one characteristic that distinguishes it from the common knowledge or in patent terms from the prior art. So. Uh, as you see in the little image uh, here, it can be a more productive crop, it can be a flower with a certain color, it can be the resistant to a certain virus. But it has the new plant variety, in order to have protection, has to have that new characteristic. Uniformity. It means that when I cultivate the individuals, I grow the individuals of my plant variety, they should all look the same. So in one generation, I should appreciate the very same characteristics of that plant variety. So if the characteristic is a, a yellow flower, all the flowers must be yellow. Seems easy, but uh, in, uh, in, in, in botany, in, bi in biology, it's not so, so easy sometimes. And stability, it means that when I multiply the year after year after year after year, the plant variety, this has to show the very same characteristics. So these are the technical requirements. What, how do I know if, uh, as an examination office, if the uh, variety, the candidate variety, the one that is object of the application has those technical requirements? There is no other way but growing the plant and observing it. So we call this the technical examination, and it's only focused on the DUS requirement. Uh, we call this uh, um, the, the setting where the plant variety, the candidate variety is uh, examined, a growing trial. Uh, you may know that the CPVO is a quite uh, small agency, uh, 50 people work for us. So you can imagine that we are not in a situation where we can uh, organize a growing trial for every single uh, candidate variety that we have. This is also because we receive a variety, a very diverse 
species when it comes to our application, and we could not, we could never cultivate them all in Angers. Some of them require a warmer climate or a, a, a more rainy climate. So what do we do? We entrust, oops, sorry, we entrust national authorities that already have the infrastructure to uh, carry out this growing trial trials and we entrust them. So we make with them an agreement where we say this is our um, uh, technical examination, this is the uh, plant varieties, the species that I want you to examine and I entrust you with that. Uh, that sounds very easy but it's actually a lot of work of coordination. We also have a quality and audit service that monitors all the authorities in the 27 member states. Novelty is a commercial novelty, so it's different from the novelty of, uh, of patents and it means that the plant variety shouldn't have been put on the market before the application. We have a great spirit, of course. And finally, a variety denomination. It is absolutely necessary that when you come up with a new plant, you give it a name so that on the market, when you see a brown seed of uh, a, a brown bag of seeds, you know what you're buying as a consumer or as a grower. And uh, this is an essential, essential requirement. It is not possible to have your variety registered and protected without a variety denomination. These are uh, just a few uh, data on our, our application procedure and the fees. Uh, if you're interested uh, to register your variety, these are the prices. We're very affordable, I think. For the work that we do, it's, uh, it's not a lot. And these are, I, I'll end my presentation with our publicly available tools. All these tools are uh, available for free. Uh, when you will receive the presentation, there's actually a link in the slide, so you may click on it and you will be redirected to this tool. Uh, first of all, it's public search where you can see what's on our official publications and our gazette. Then we have the variety finder where you can find right by right all the denomination for what variety with the applicant when it was, um, if the right is still in force, if it's expired. And the variety finder does not only contain our register, but it contains the, reg the register of a series of, um, of countries in the world. So you can really uh, make a, a comprehensive research in all the UPOP members. And finally, the PVR case law database that includes um, uh, decisions of our boards of appeal and of the Court of Justice concerning plan variety rights. So I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you for your patience and attention. And uh, I'll leave you here the, um, our contact. You may contact us by email. Um, we are on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You will receive uh, the slides very soon. And uh, this slide includes also the links to our social media. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very, very much <clears throat> for the presentation. It was very interesting and especially very nice and well prepared also for the eyes. So congratulations for that as well. Um, do we have a couple of minutes to answer a couple of questions? Would you like to, Ceci? Yes. We have received one at the moment, so just let me show them to the whole audience, which means take back the rights. And uh, just show my screen. So the first question is for me, uh, which is which you answered actually already, but uh, <clears throat> I will give again um, the slides and recording of today's webinar. So a link in order to see the recording is going to be sent to you by uh, our training team uh, at the latest tomorrow morning, uh, and you can receive a PDF slide of the presentation you just saw and you're going to see also uh, the link for the recording where you can simply click on and uh, see the whole presentation once again at any moment uh, in streaming online. Um, and uh, 
with regard to the second question instead, I don't think I'm the best qualified here to answer to that. Okay, do we have an hour to, re to reply to that question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, it's uh, it's really difficult. Um, first of all, uh, just for the rest of the audience, um, may, uh, an EDV is an uh, essentially the right variety. As I said before, we have this breeder's exemption where if we innovate through productive varieties, indeed we do not have to uh, ask for permission to the breeder or to pay any royalty. However, there is the situation of uh, essentially the right varieties where there is, uh, we create something that is different, but not that different, so we do have to ask for permission. This is a concept that is technically and legally extremely complex, and um, sometimes, no, there is no way to uh, identify a new plant variety as an EDV or as a mutation, at least uh, um, analyzing the gene, uh, the, the genetics of this plant variety. What I can do for you, uh, which is not replying clearly to your question right now is to send you a link to the um, a very interesting webinar that our senior legal advisor um, Montserrat Garcia Monco did in French on this uh, on this uh, topic. So uh, you can send me an email. I'll share it with you if you like. And uh, but just for you to know, this is a very hot topic for both legal uh, legal people involved in the plant variety world and technical people. So it's not clear. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Uh, we have another couple of questions. Um, like I think I suppose enforcement of PVP right is might be done through national courts isn't it indeed so uh this is very similar to uh, uh european union trademarks and community designs we do have a regional right that is granted on the um, at the european union agency level however the enforcement of their right has to be done before the national um the national courts there is a, some kind of division in the competence between the CPVO and the national court, and it's, uh, um, this is contained in our basic regulation. Um, we have the right, uh, the Community Plan Variety Office has the competence to establish whether the right is valid or not. So if you are seeking a declaration uh, of a title as null and void, you have to, uh, you have to contact us and start an analytic procedure. However, if you want to enforce your plan, your plan variety right, you will have to check where the infringement act took place and uh, ask for the help of a national judge. And uh, maybe you will have to, to hire a national lawyer. <laughs> I hope that is for you from your country, so it's, uh, it's easier. Yeah, yeah, this is what you do. And this is why it's essential uh, that uh, um, national courts cooperate among each other so that they have the same understanding of certain basic concepts. As you may imagine, uh, biotechnology is not the favorite subject of uh, judges or of lawyers. So it is necessary a certain awareness in that, uh, um, in that field so that there is not uh, form shopping. Form shopping consists of uh, and trying to uh, use the difference in the approaches of uh, national court to um, gain certain benefits. I hope that was clear. Yes, <laughs> at least for me. Um, but there are no further questions regarding that particular part, so I think also for participants. Um, there's another question if um, a question uh, a participant's asking could you explain how plant right protection differs from patent and I would add also if I may as is there cases where plant variety protection and patent protection are applicable on a same um, item or plant just curiosity okay uh, it shouldn't be the case and the, the short answer is that it shouldn't be the case. Actually, uh, what happened in the developing of the legislations on uh, patents and plant variety protection is that they were not created at the same time in a coordinated way. So 
uh, and they also were created uh, now 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. In the last 20, 25 years, a lot happened in technology. So what it was clearly uh, uh, protectable either by patents or community plan variety rights is not clear anymore because we have some uh, techniques that evolved, some techniques where the, the product looks like a natural mutation result. So um, the distinction between uh, patents and community plan variety rights in a certain specific uh, cases may not be that clear. This is why the CPVO is constantly uh, cooperating with the EPO. We have uh, exchange of knowledge, we have exchange of database, we send uh, them data for their uh, for the database, we receive uh, trainings from them, we provide training to them, so we, we really need a certain coordination among us because this is, uh, um, there is some very small overlap in the subject matter of protection that has to be clarified and has been uh, clarified by the enlarged board of appeal of the EPO in the in the latest months. And luckily, we're not uh, um, enlightening uh, results because it's a very complex matter. So, and uh, so this is the subject matter. And the difference in production in the result is what we mentioned before, the farm safe seeds uh, limitation and the breeders exemption. This does not exist in patents. It's not, it wasn't provided by the system. So yeah. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, there, there are a couple of questions still. I hope I'm not bothering you with them, but that shows the interest of the participants as well. So it's a very nice sign of um, of interest from uh, uh, the audience. If you are tired of questions, just let me know and uh, I will send them to the helpline for answering. So don't be shy and just say to me, it's enough. <laughs> no problem, go for it. So after the 25 years of protection, if the owner does not reconduct the PVP, um, is the owner owed to deliver its variety to the community, such as European uh, Gin Bank? Yeah, so I think the question is what happens after the 25 years to the really variety and where is it stored, if I understood correctly? Okay, so there is no obligation to store this variety in any gene bank. Actually, the gene banks are uh, managed in a completely uh, different system that is not necessarily connected to IP protection. Gene banks may, uh, may contain, of course, uh, uh, varieties of common knowledge, of traditional knowledge. It really doesn't depend on IP protection. What you have to do in the beginning of your application process is to send us the material of your uh, of your candidate variety. Uh, we saw before that we need to observe your candidate variety in a growing trial. So we need the material, you need to send it to us, and it also needs to comply with our requirements. It has to be virus-free, sent in certain moments of the year so that we can observe it in, uh, in the right time of the year, for instance, the flowering for certain variety. What happens to the material is that uh, the examination office, so the national authority that is carrying out the growing, practically, the growing trial, may keep uh, your material in the reference collection. However, uh, what's the reference collection? The reference collection is this uh, collection of plants that the examination office has to keep uh, so that it can compare the candidate varieties to the prior art. So once your, the examination of your candidate variety is finished, it uh, will be kept in that reference collection. However, the examination office is bound by our entrustment agreement, which means that uh, your uh, variety can only be used for comparing future candidate varieties. So they cannot, uh, they cannot make any use of that, uh, of that variety. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. There's another question. How to know the trade name of a protected variety? Uh, we need don't to really we... understand it, but maybe. Yeah, um, I, you really need to specify something more about what you mean with train, with train name. So I'm going to take a guess. I think that you mean trademark. 
how do you know what's the uh, the trademark behind a certain variety maybe um okay um I'll just assume that this is what you asked for. And well, the, the relationship between um, plum variety rights or plum variety denomination and trademark has to be, is, uh, can be, is or can be uh, sometimes complex because these are two completely different rights, but they may be used in combination with each other. Actually, on the 29th of April, we will provide a presentation on uh, IP protection in the agri-food sector, and you will see how these, uh, um, these different rights can be uh, used in combination in the framework of a certain business strategy. However, you have to be aware of the completely different function of the plant variety denomination and of the trademark. The plant variety denomination serves the purpose of identifying the plant material on the market, while the trademark uh, needs to indicate the commercial origin of a certain product. Just to give you an example, you may know the apple pink lady. It's quite well known, it's really delicious, I really like it. And the trademark Pink Lady uh, in actually refers to three different varieties uh, that look very similar in the eyes of, uh, uh, of a consumer, but I have uh, different uh, um, growing conditions and the, the, they are different from each other. So you can see the difference between uh, the trademark and the plant variety denomination. Um, how do you know? If a certain uh, plum, uh, if a certain plum variety is marketed under uh, a certain trademark, you cannot use our variety finder for that because we are talking about two different registers. But usually, uh, you can find that on the website of the company when they use a certain trademark. Make this experiment, for instance, for Pink Lady. They do have a page where they indicate the actual plum variety that they sell. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm taking the next question. How to contact you for the PowerPoint containing information regarding the EDV and mutation? Uh, I saw Lionel in uh, the uh, participants list, so it's very nice uh, to see you, Lionel. It's uh, a pleasure uh, that you could take part uh, to the webinar. I would kindly ask you to send to me the recording and the PowerPoint uh, that uh, Ursula introduced before, so that I can insert them in the follow-up email, and we will distribute them also to all participants that seem to be interested in the content that was there. I, I think uh, we can also get in touch later on because unfortunately you cannot answer me because you're muted, but uh, I wanted also to say hello uh, to you in the audience. Um, can non-EU breeders get a PVP right on their non-EU plants? Uh -huh. Yes, I, of course. If the non-EU breeder wants to protect its new plant variety, can uh, he or she can, of course, um, apply for a community plant variety right in the European Union. However, non-EU breeders will have to be represented by a procedural representative with its seat or domicile in the European Union. This is the only condition that we require and it's uh, for practical reason actually, but they, if they feel like they need protection in the territory of the European Union, they can uh, apply for protection. They, my only, the only caveat that I would like to say is that pay attention to the timing. Pay attention to the priority, to the novelty, and uh, this is also about the importance of having uh, an adequate uh, IP strategy when it comes to protecting your uh, your innovation. And you have to think about the scope, the territorial scope of the protection that you're seeking from the beginning. Otherwise, it may be not possible to do it at a later stage. Perfect. I swear. It's the last two questions, um, which I don't understand, unfortunately. Maybe it's a little bit too technical. Uh, if technologies like CRISPR, CAS, are technologies like CRISPR and CAS regulated uh, like GMO in the European Union, maybe? I, I am assuming that you're referring to CRISPR. Uh, uh, technologies, which are these uh, uh, new breeding techniques that we uh, we mentioned uh, before, and they consist in uh, 
cutting, uh, cutting and paste uh, sets of genes from a plant species to the other. And uh, uh, the reason of your question, I imagine, is the fact that uh, when I obtain a new plant variety uh, using this technique, it's not possible to identify whether the result is a natural mutation or is a mutation carried out through this technique. This is uh, indeed um, an issue that is quite problematic from, from a point of view, from a legal and technical point of view, but especially a legal point of view. And I invite you to subscribe to the webinar that we will provide on this very uh, topic on the 8th of, uh, of June through the um, European IP Help Desk. So we will dig in this very complex matter also with the help of our technical uh, expert, Sisi Colonia. Thank you also for making promotion for our next webinars. It's really perfect. Last question. Don't you think trademarks are a way of retaining exclusivity over the varieties harvested material? They may be. Uh, and this, is, uh, this will constitute a misuse of intellectual property rights. And this is why it's essential that uh, uh, UIPO, for instance, or the National Trademark Office and the CPPO collaborate and keep the uh, exchange of information that they carry out right now. We're actually providing a training in uh, a month, a month and a half, uh, to them to refresh the mind of examiners on the importance and the function of, um, of a variety denomination. It's important to raise awareness on that so that there is a, such a misuse of IP rights is not uh, carried out, at least in the European Union. Perfect, perfect. It's been really a pleasure for me to carry out this webinar uh, today with you. Um, we were quite a number, around 90 participants, uh, also outside the European Union, which is something that not always happens. Um, so I only have to say thank you very, very much to you, uh, Sissi, for being here. And uh, that I'm absolutely very, very happy to carry out the next few webinars in June uh, with you and uh, uh, collaborate also with your communication colleagues and your nice team in uh, Anja. Thanks a lot again for this opportunity, Miguel. It was uh, a pleasure as uh, usual. I will leave my, my contact in the PowerPoint presentation that, uh, that will be shared later. So if anyone has more question, follow-up questions, please uh, feel free to, to send us an email or to contact through our uh, social media channels. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye everyone. Thank you for being with us.